Let's go ahead and take our Bibles out, please, and turning them to the book of Esther. The book of Esther. All right, Esther chapter number nine. Let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for what you've written to us in the book of Esther. God, we ask that you would give us understanding of the truths that you want us to live in this passage today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me just confer real quick with upstairs. Do we have the mic issue solved? So I need to stay here, don't I? Okay. So I'm not going to be down in the center aisle because apparently this is not uh, cooperating this morning. i got to stay right here. Unless I disconnect this, I can carry it around. It's not going to work either. All right. So have you ever met someone that you didn't like? Do not look at anyone, okay? <laughs> Boy, you all are looking at me right now. Oh. Or at least you, you thought they didn't like you based on, I don't know, some things that they said about you or to you, or, or maybe the things they did that opposed you, they actually did some things to oppose you. You know, it seems there is always someone who's going to oppose anything you do. If you've been in a position of leadership, you know that's true. No matter what you do, someone's not going to like it. That's kind of like leadership 101 there. Sometimes it's the same person in your life. Uh, you, can, you can almost count on it. No matter what you do, they oppose it. When it comes to the things of Christ versus the things of the world. Now, Christ tells us, plan on it. People are going to oppose you. Well, now, let's take a pause here for a moment. You say, Pastor, I've not had anyone oppose my Christianity. Well, then one of two things is happening. Either we are not living our Christianity the way God says we're to live it, or God lied to us in the Bible. Hmm, which one do you want to put money on? <laughs> Christ said people will oppose us. The things of God are foolishness to the world. They don't make sense to the world. They have, they have a different philosophy of life than we do. And in some cases, and we know this to be true, some people are just prejudiced. They, they, they tear down, they degrade those of... Uh, a different race, a different color, different religion. By the way, we have to be careful about that too. We're not exempt from prejudice when it comes to different religions, okay? They can be wrong, but we don't have to be derogatory about their wrongness, do we? Because they were created in God's image and God loves them, and so should we. But people can become, or uh, some are prejudiced when it comes to race, color, religion. How about this? Social status. Are we ever prejudiced when it comes to social status? How about, how about the, the guy on the corner with the sign will work for food? What are our thoughts about that person? When my wife and I were wife and I were on vacation this summer, I actually saw a guy on on a street corner in Tennessee with a sign. Okay, and I mean, I guess in a sense you got to admire their honesty because you always wonder if they're being honest about I need food, you know, or whatever. This guy said, "I'll not lie. I need weed." That's what it said on his sign, and he was having people stop and give him money, you know. Um, I guess you got to admire the honesty there. I don't know. 
James, James makes this illustration, so I'm going to do that this morning just to get us thinking here. He says, if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring and costly apparel, and there come in another, a poor man in vile raiment, and you say to the one with the, the, with, with the costly apparel, sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, sit here at my footstool, are ye not then become partial? How do we respond when different people walk in those doors? Can we possibly be prejudiced? So we're not just talking about racists out there when we're dealing with prejudice. Sometimes it does find its way into the church. So what do we do? Well, let's look at our passage this morning and learn what to do. Because at some point in time, God said we will face opposition. We will be the recipients of prejudice, opposition. There is hope for all of us, folks. Jesus Christ. That is the answer to prejudice in our world. It's not another law, folks. It's not a movement, no matter what the letters are, that will not fix prejudiceness. Prejudiceness, yes. Christ is the answer to that. It's not demonstrations on the street. It's not demanding our rights, demanding reparations for something that happened hundreds of years ago. It's Jesus Christ that is the answer. Christ came to preach deliverance. Any talk of ending prejudiceness and opposition in this world aside from Christ is waste because it needs Christ. Deliverance from Christ preached deliverance from prejudice, from discrimination, from divisions. That's why divisions in the church don't belong in the church. If there's a division over anything, no matter how small it is, it doesn't belong there. Christ didn't bring it in. God doesn't sanction division. God doesn't bless divisions. I wonder where it came from and who's promoting it. We need to get it out when it comes in. Not just into our church, but when it's in our homes. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Husbands and wives, division, get rid of it. Here's, here's some wisdom from a child, okay? Our evangelist that was here this week. In the, in the Angles trailer, they have, an, they have a fish tank. I know. <laughs> How do you travel down the road with a fish tank, right? <laughs> it's a little fish bowl. They, they drain it about halfway, put it in the sink, pack towels around it when they're traveling so the fish is okay. He's a little shook up when they get to their next <laughs> stop, but they put more water back in there or whatever. And they have this little betta fish. Are you familiar with the betta fish? There's, there, you never see more than one in a tank, okay? Because if you put more than one in a tank, they fight until one of them's dead. So Vance, the little guy, very good question. He said, Dad, if that's true, how do they breed? <laughs> wow, I'm glad I wasn't his dad. <laughs> well, son. There's a principle there for us, husbands and wives, okay? Divisions don't belong. Get them out. Don't allow them to be there. Apparently, if you've got children, there was a time when you did get along, okay? Stop being a beta fish. There's a new slogan, don't be a beta, right? Put it on t-shirts. <laughs> What we're talking about here is heart issues. We can be free from these heart issues. 
And that's the message of this passage. Let's remember, as we jump into our passage here, that a decree of extermination had been issued by Haman, the former prime minister. The decree would have actually wiped out the entire Jewish population. But Queen Esther's bravery and God's providence, which we've talked a lot about as we've gone through Esther, they allowed the plan to be exposed. Now remember the problem though. Persian law was such that, and we thought Illinois was bad without a concealed carry permit. Persian law was you couldn't ever carry a weapon or take a weapon to defend yourself even in your own homes. That's the way the, the empire was. That's the way the king ruled. And Persian law was also such that once a decree was issued, which it had been, it could never be taken back. The king couldn't say, oh, we can't do that. I take it back. I'll, I'll uh, disqualify that or something. So the king's got a problem. What does he do? He issued a second decree, which allowed the Jews the right to defend themselves. That was the best he could do. On that one day, okay? So let's look at this first outline point here of preparation for warfare. The, the Jews had successfully defended themselves. What happened is described in detail in our passage. Look with me at verse 1. Now, in the 12th month, that is, the month Adar, on the 13th day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put in execution, in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them. And then there's just in parentheses there. Though it was turned to the contrary that the Jews had rule over them that hated them. Okay. Verse 2. The Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus to lay hand on such as sought their hurt. And no man could withstand them for fear of them fell upon all the people and all the rulers of the provinces and the lieutenants and deputies and officers of the king helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them for Mordecai was great in the king's house and his fame went throughout all the provinces for this man Mordecai waxed greater and greater Thus the Jews smote all their enemies with the stroke of the sword and slaughter and destruction and did what they would unto those that hated them. Now, I'm going to jump down to verse 10. The ten sons of Haman, the sons of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, slew they. But on the spoil laid they not their hand. Let me just pause for a moment here. The original decree of extermination issued or uh, proposed by Haman allowed for anyone who didn't like the Jews to rise up on this one day and kill any Jews they wanted, all of them in fact, and after killing them, they could take whatever property those Jews owned for their own spoils, okay? On that day, the tables were turned and as we're reading here, the Jews having the authority of the king as well to defend themselves, went on the attack. But it says, on the spoil laid they not their hand. Verse 11, on that day, the number of those that were slain in Shushan, the palace, was brought before the king. And the king said unto Esther, the queen, the Jews have slain and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, the palace, the palace city, and the 10 sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? And then he asked her, now what is thy petition and it shall be granted thee? What is thy request further and it shall be done? Then said Esther, if it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews which are in Shushan to do tomorrow also according unto this day's decree. And let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. I know that's sounding pretty gruesome. All right, let's read on. And the king commanded it so to be done. And the decree was given at Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. For the Jews that were in Shushan gathered themselves together on the 14th day also, 
of the month Adar, and slew 300 men at Shushan, but on the prey they laid not their hand. Once again, they did not take the spoil. Verse 16, but the other Jews that were in the king's provinces gathered themselves together and stood for their lives and had rest from their enemies and slew of their foes 70 and 5,000, but they laid not their hands on the prey or on the spoil. On the 13th day of the month Adar and on the 14th day of the same rested they and made it a day of feasting and, glad, uh, and, and gladness. Now, let me just stop there and let's consider this. The day has arrived. The 13th day of the month. The enemies of the Jews wake up that morning, hoped to erase them from existence. But the tables were turned with that second decree. And here's how. First, the Jews had time to prepare, which they did. They took the time to prepare for the warfare for the opposition that was coming. They banded together as one group in the city. There's a picture there of unity, folks. Churches that aren't unified die. That's generally the way it works. Secondly, God placed a fear in the hearts of the anti-Semites. They actually... Um, they, 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 the, the fear made them unsuccessful in attacking the Jews. They were apprehensive in their, in their efforts. Once again, we have a demonstration of the sovereignty of God, folks, working on our behalf. The Persian nobles were also part of God's plan in all of this. They actually helped the Jews. Why? Well, the king and had, had thrown his support into this behind Mordecai. The, the, the Jew, the new prime minister, Mordecai, in verse 3, it says they actually feared Mordecai's power. Which, as we've already seen, God arranged all of that ahead of time. Before this 13th day of the month, Adar. So for those three reasons, orchestrated by God, the Jews gained a victory. On the 13th day of this month, Adar. Prior to that, they had no clue what God was doing behind the scenes. They survived. Instead of being victims, they actually were able to defend themselves. They were strong. They were prepared. They were confident. They were able to secure a complete victory. In verse 6, we read that they killed nearly 500 men in the, in the palace city. Verses 7 through 9, the ten sons of Haman. But we also need to note something else here, which I pointed out earlier as I was reading through. They didn't take any spoils. In fact, it's repeated three times in our passage. The only motive that they had was just to defend themselves. They weren't on the attack. They weren't out to get back. They killed those that came towards them, those that were opposed to them, but they didn't go after and wipe out their families and steal all their property. That wasn't their motive. You see, there's a big difference between defending yourself and going after someone to get back. That wasn't their motive. At some point during the day, the king had reported to Queen Esther the news of the fighting that had been taking place. He asked if there was anything else. And uh, you maybe remember that portion of the passage. She, she wanted the Jews in Shushan to have one more day to pursue those that were fleeing. But she also wanted the ten sons of Haman, Haman to be hanged and displayed publicly. Why do you suppose that was? For a warning and a deterrent from others. It was a cultural thing. They did that often. Leave the body hanging there as a message to other people. Here was the result of all of this. Another 300 enemies were taken in Shushan. 75,000 of their enemies across the entire empire uh, were destroyed and the Jews did not take any of the spoils. 
Now, here's some thoughts on this. The Jews were able to help save themselves from extermination by preparing. If they had not prepared, they were, the, the second decree had been issued actually a couple of months before this actual day happened. If they had not prepared, prepared the Persian citizens who hated them would have tried to wipe them off the face of the earth. God's sovereignty, his providence, worked out the circumstances that allowed this victory to happen. But, let me point out, the Jews still had to prepare. Not just sit around and wait for God to do his thing. Like sometimes we do. Yes, God is sovereign. I, I really believe in the sovereignty of God. And I think that may be uh, one, of my, one of my strengths as far as my spiritual gifts. The gift of faith. I just trust God's on this. God's got it. God is faithful. It'll be all right. As uh, my friend from my Georgetown church used to say, it'd be all right. Just like that too. God is sovereign. Whatever he's got planned is going to happen. Okay. If it's God's plan that your engine blow up later this week, then it doesn't matter if you do an oil change or not. Your engine's going to blow up this week. And if it's God's plan that your engine doesn't blow up this week, it doesn't matter if it's out of oil. It's not going to blow up this week because it's not. See, God is sovereign. Some people take those kinds of steps and think, well, I don't have to get my oil changed. Because <laughs> if God doesn't want my engine to blow up, it won't. Yeah, try that when your gas gets on empty, right? Okay. God is sovereign. And he, he, we, we've seen his providence, his working things behind the scenes. But the Jews still had to prepare. He could have taken care of things on that day all on his own. But instead, he required them to prepare for that opposition. Preparation is, is so essential for us, folks, we can we can just uh, say a prayer of salvation and then sit back and wait for God to do His thing in our life, right? As Christians, though, we must prepare to stand, not sit, to stand against the attack of any enemy, whether it's a real person, a circumstance or spiritual enemy. And there are many enemies. When we stand for righteousness, when we actually stand for righteousness, not just come to church and say, we believe this, and, oh, we believe that is so wrong. I can't believe they're doing that. And then when we go out there, hmm, we don't speak about it outside of here. That's not standing, okay? When we actually stand for righteousness and the claims of Christ that sinners are going to die and spend eternity in hell. When we actually claim the claims of Christ that this activity is a sin according to God's word. Instead of saying, well, it's... You know, it's your personal choice. It's not for me to judge. No, it's not for you to judge. The judge has already judged and said, this is sin. But when we actually stand for the claims of Christ, by the way, Christ also said, love your enemies. Not hate them, love them. And when we stand for the claims of Christ, there will be those that oppose us. Which is maybe why on some things we stay quiet and we don't take stands. Christ demands that we give all to the cause of Christ. Not just the part that's comfortable for us, but 
all, not just the part that is makes financial sense to us, but give all to Christ. This is, this is what we would call total commitment. Don't you enjoy that from your spouse? Total commitment. And don't say, well, I'm waiting for that to happen. <laughs> we expect that. And in that context, in that concept, we understand what total commitment is. There is no one else on any level on the side. Christ demands that we give all for Christ. Total commitment. We are to give our all so the gospel can be taken to the world and the needs of people everywhere can be met to the best of what God blesses us to do, both in our own local communities and throughout the world, folks. Be assured, though, that when we stand for righteousness and total commitment are demanded by Christ, there will be those who oppose us. The devil, for sure, unbelievers will try to stop our witness. Sometimes, many times, all they have to, they don't have to pass a law and violate our amendments, our rights. All they have to do is mock us. And that, and that seems to be very effective in getting Christians to back down from taking a stand. But in, in some parts of the world, Christians face persecution and even death for just saying they're a Christian. Let me give you an example of preparation. We prepare to take a trip, don't we? We, we prepare for our Harvest Crusade, which we just finished. We prepare the kids for school. Sometime, I guess, the end of July, going into August, what change do you see take place at Walmart? School supplies everywhere. School bags, school lunch, lunch boxes, and papers, and pens, and folders, and crayons, and glue, and all kinds of stuff. It's just never ending. Imagine how things would go if we didn't prepare. If we just woke up in one morning and decided to move forward with no preparation. I know some of you are thinking, well, that's kind of how they approach the school year this year. <laughs> Be compassionate. This is new ground for everybody. For example, Thanksgiving's coming up. Any of you ladies have some interesting turkey stories? I got online to read what other people have done with turkeys. You would not believe the number of houses that have burned down due to someone trying to fry a turkey in the garage, which I'm pretty sure the instructions clearly say, don't do this indoors, right? Frozen turkey. I have a family member that um, I, I believe I remember this story correctly. Uh, they got up Thanksgiving morning, start preparing for Thanksgiving dinner, pull the turkey out of the freezer. Yeah, some of you know that's not good, okay? You got to start thawing that bird days ahead of time, you know, to get it all thawed out. I don't remember how that story ended, but um, we have to make preparations. So God tells us to prepare ourselves for opposition and persecution. It is absolutely essential if we are going to know what victory is. And just like, um, just like you can go to various websites to know how to prepare for Thanksgiving dinner. I think Butterball even has one as well as horror stories. <laughs> God tells us how to prepare for this. 
Here's the step. Steps number one, put on the armor of God. Wow, that sounds so basic, right? Some of you probably know what passage we're going to go to. If you're thinking Ephesians 6, you're absolutely right. We're not going to take a lot of time picking apart all the pieces of armor, but we do need to put armor on. Let's read the passage, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. There's the reason for preparing ourselves with this armor, to stand against the deceptions of Satan. Verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. What, are, what parts of the armor are we to take on? All of it. If you're going into battle, okay, and, and you are given some armor to protect yourself, how much of it are you going to take? You're going against someone bigger, badder, rougher, tougher, stronger than you. You're going you're gonna to take it all. You're going to use it all. Every bit of it. We are wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, rulers of darkness, high places, Satan. We need all the armor that we can get. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always, by the way, that's another weapon that we should take up. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Step number two, be ready to give an answer. Why do you believe the way you do? Why does your church believe this? Why, do you, why is this wrong? I mean, after all, and they give their viewpoint, are you able to give an answer? My church doesn't believe in it is not sufficient. What does God say about it? Well, my friend, here's what God's word says. First Peter chapter three, and verse 15, it says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I love that God put that on the end of that verse. Why does God, why does your church believe this is wrong? Because that's nasty, that's wickedness. But I'm supposed to do it with, meekness and reverence. How we respond to them is just as important as what we respond with. Step number three, God says, love your enemies. We're preparing ourselves here for opposition. Preparing ourselves by first loving our enemies. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44, Christ said, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you. Let me stop right there before we go on. Let's just consider that what that verse is saying. Christ said, love your enemies. We get that. We understand that. That's a, that's a little mantra, a quip that we throw out there so easily. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. I know we've preached that before in the context of our homes, of our churches. People that don't get along with us. We're supposed to love them and bless them. Not talk about them. Would you agree that goes in there? We're, we're, we're not blessing them if we're talking, talking smack about them, running them down. That's not blessing our enemies. 
We're supposed to do good to them that hate us. Pray for them which despitefully use us. And so, yes, we, we, we ought to stop talking about those people that have offended us. Can I expand that a little bit outside the church wall since we are coming up on November? Would that also apply to politicians and our government and our governor? Man, I can't believe it. What he just did, he's trying to shut down churches. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. What does that exactly look like? I don't know. It depends on the situation. But I do know that a lot of what, whenever I, whenever I do go on social media, a lot of what I see that's politically oriented is not blessing them that curse us. Unfortunately. I want God's blessing. If we want God's blessing, we need to follow God's word. Just something to think about there. Why should we do that? Christ is saying in verse 44, here's what I want you to do. Now, verse 45, he tells us why. That ye may be the children of your father, which is in heaven. Now, um, let me finish reading it. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Now, let me just pause there for a moment, okay? Okay. Um, I come from a large family. There's six siblings. There's four boys. There's two girls. And, and many tend to say that we, we all act the same in my family. My dad's name is Gerald. People always knew him as Jerry. Yes, I am Gerald the second. Okay. But we were like, oh, you must be one of Jerry's kids. Sometimes that was bad. Sometimes it was actually a compliment. But, oh, yeah, you're one of Jerry's kids, aren't you? They, I know that has other connotations to it, but my dad's name was Jerry. And sometimes you, can, you, you are identified by your father, by the way that you act. You act like your dad. Why did God tell us to love our enemies and bless them and do good to them? that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Verse 46, For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans do the same? Okay, we could change that word there. Politicians do that. You scratch their back, they'll scratch yours, right? That's what that verse is saying. That's not love. Verse 40, um, 47, And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the, can we change it? Politicians do that. 48, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father, which is in heaven is perfect. Let's go on to step number four. We have 15. We have to get through here. Not quite that many, but more than three. Endure hardship. Remain unentangled. Okay. We've got to endure hardship. Remain unentangled. We're probably not going to get through all the steps here. Um, I'm just saying, because as I go through these, as the spirit leads, we'll just park on different things. Second Timothy chapter two, verse three, it says, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse four, no man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life. Just let that sink for a moment. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, rulers of darkness, to spiritual warfare against Satan. No man that is actually engaged in the warfare entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Why would we not get tangled up in the affairs of life? Because my general has called me to be on this mission, and I want him to think well of me. I want to please him that chose me for this mission, is what it's saying there. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. 
since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Now, there are a lot of civilian pursuits available to us today that aren't sinful. But they sure can distract us from pleasing him, doing things that please him. They can distract us. They take our time, so we're too busy to do the things that our general chose us to do because we're entangled in civilian affairs. They take our time, they take our money because this was on sale and it's and it's 0% interest for the next six years. And then I pay for it for the next 20 years and I can't afford to tithe. And people say, I just can't afford it. <laughs> How much do we spend on interest every year, folks? Because we are a slave to the lender. We can have an epiphany someday, a, a movement in our heart, and say, yes, God, yes, you finally got my attention. I am going to give back to you what you give to me, except if I do that, I'm going to jail for not paying my debts. So the master comes in who has control of that part of our life and we are a slave to them and he says no you can't give a portion of this to God's kingdom because I control it that's what Proverbs means when it says we become a slave to the lender we become entangled in this life's affairs we become entangled when it comes to social things that we like to do social things we get our kids involved in and therefore we cannot serve him totally committedly. It's like going down the altar and pledging your commitment to your spouse for six days a week instead of seven. Because, you know, you got these other things, you know, six days a week, you got me in the seventh day. I'm, I'm going to go hang out with my friends and the guys. Don't, don't worry about it. That's not yours. That's mine. And, and you got, you got me the other six days. Unfortunately, reality, folks, as Christians, God gets one day and we get the other six without even thinking about God. And actually, for most Christians, God gets part of one day, two hours in the morning. That's if we come to Sunday school too. Wow. Wow. We're talking about preparing for the opposition. I mean, if we're not doing this, if we are entangled in the affairs of this life, we are not prepared for that opposition when it comes. Step number five, be angry about sin. Not the person. Ephesians 4.26, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Folks, be angry at sin. It's okay to be angry at sin. The sin that was done to us, by the way, can I say it a different way? It's okay to be angry at sin. Let me say it this way. Be angry about sin. We don't get angry about sin anymore. We look the other way, we tolerate it. We don't wanna hurt people's feelings, right? Am I right? Amen. Be angry, but don't sin with how you express your anger. When, when, when we don't even get angry at our own sin, when we don't do this, the verse says that we give place to the devil, we give him an opportunity, as we've been talking about on Wednesday nights, we give him real estate in our minds. He establishes a foothold, and then he goes into other areas of our lives. Number six, it says, seek peace. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Now, here's a passage we've covered on our Wednesday nights dealing with strongholds. This is, a, this is a command to follow peace and also a warning. It's saying in verse 14, follow peace, straightforward command. 
But the warning, it says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. Now, what is God talking about there? If you haven't been with us on Wednesdays, this is going to be all new for you. Do we understand what that is saying? We fail to get the grace of God. Is that talking about salvation? Well, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, or 2, 8, it says, um, by grace are we saved through faith. So we get grace at the moment of salvation. God shows grace by saving us. So how do we fail to obtain grace? After we're saved, God has all these commands for us to do as Christians, doesn't he? Any of you find them easy to do? Not me. Impossible without the grace of God enabling me to do these things. So we, get, we, we have grace when we're saved, and then daily living requires grace from God to live the way he intends, intended us to, do, to live. We can't do it without his grace. So this is a warning that it's possible to not be able to access that grace that we need for daily living when we're not seeking peace. We may be all justified and right and arrogant about our position and our rightness and how wrong they were and, and blah, 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 blah. We can just go on and on and on with how right we are and how wrong they were. And if we are not stepping down from our, our stand, going to that person to seek peace, we are cutting off God's grace that we need every day to live a godly life. We're shooting ourselves in the foot. We think we're so right and we're shooting ourselves by cutting off God's grace from our life. Without that grace, we will struggle in other areas of our lives. It, in a, it, 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 and we can't live that life in a way that pleases God. These two things are connected, seeking peace and getting grace from God for our own daily living. They're connected, we don't even realize it. So what, what would cause us not getting this grace? The absence of following peace. Step number seven, avoid foolish arguments that cause divisions. I think, I think uh, the passage we're going to look at is an excellent passage for pastors who have too much time on their hands. Which ain't me, okay? I'm talking about pastors that seem to have all this extra time to get on blogs and websites and chat rooms. Or I know chat rooms, they don't have those anymore. They're blogs or whatever. And they're just deep, deep, deep nitpicking about, you know, what color the ark was or some insignificant, irrelevant thing in the Bible that God doesn't state clearly, therefore he doesn't want us to know clearly, or it's not important, but they're arguing over which side's right. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 2, it says, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men apt to teach, patient, foolish and unlearned questions. Now, we're not just talking about theological tit-for-tat arguing. Foolish and unlearned questions. Well, what color is the carpet going to be? I'm, I'm glad we've never had that discussion here at Grace. Never had to go through that. Some churches do. Where's the clock going to be in the auditorium? We've always done it that way. Foolish, unlearned questions avoid. They gender strife, which is not a God thing, by the way. Folks, if there's a, if there's a church that's embroiled in strife and an argument, I don't care who's right and who's wrong. It's not a God thing. And Satan is in that church working right at that moment. Doesn't matter who's right. The servant of the Lord, it says, must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Apt to teach, ready, ready to teach. Instead of forcing and chewing someone out, 
you have the approach of ready to teach someone. Verse 25, it says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Let's go one more step number eight. Keep our eyes on the reward. So far, everything we've looked at here is like, oh man, I'm tired already. I'm ready for a vacation. The week hasn't even started. This week of spiritual warfare and battle. Woo! Thank you, Pastor. You just encouraged me, pump me up for the week. I'm just going to go home, crawl in bed, and I'll see you next Sunday. Wake me up. <laughs> Keep our eyes on the reward, folks. This is what it's all about. First Tim or Second Timothy chapter 4. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. In other words, you say you're a Christian, show it 100%. For I am now ready to be offered, Paul is saying, and the time of my departure is at hand. He's getting ready to die. He knows it. Verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. Folks, these steps, steps to take to prepare us, to keep us prepared to dwell in a world that is against us. We must remember, this is not our world. Remind you of a song? This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through, right? That's more than a song, that's truth. This world, forgive my grammar, this ain't our home, folks. Let's just say it like it is. This is not our home. If you've taken a mission trip before, you can relate to this. You take a mission trip, and it's kind of like a mission trip. Okay, like like when we went to Haiti, the group that went to Haiti for two weeks, it was miserable. You've heard us talk about it before. You've heard me talk about it multiple times. It was miserable. It was awful. Okay. But here was my hope. This place ain't my home. I'm just passing through. That's how we could endure. Uh. Sleeping on concrete. Well, I could. John and Jenna had a bed. <laughs> That's how I could endure taking a shower under just a pipe with no shower head and cold water came out of it. As you wedged yourself between the stool and the bathroom and this little sink and hopefully get it, okay? Well, that's how I could endure it. Someone else had a hot shower <laughs> down the hall from their bed, okay? But, so they can't relate to this, but I can. Perhaps you can vicariously through me relate to this. Hey, this isn't my home. It doesn't matter how awful it gets. It doesn't matter how bad life dumps on me. It doesn't matter how mean people are to me. It doesn't matter how mean I think people are to me. It doesn't matter. I'm just passing through. This isn't my world. This isn't my home. It could be for some. Michael Anderson was only here two months for a mission trip. For some, 90 plus years. But then we go home for the rest of eternity. We never have to come back. Well, we will, but it'll be a whole lot different then, okay? <laughs> On a mission trip, the conditions are not always favorable, but we're not here in this world forever. We are going home. And that's our hope that's before us. While we're here, God promises to strengthen us. Remember that God said in Hebrews, he would never leave us nor forsake us. In Isaiah, he tells us, fear not, 
in Isaiah, he tells us, fear not. He is with us. He will strengthen us. He will help us. He will uphold us. He tells us we are his. Prepare for the opposition that will come when we commit to our general, to standing for righteousness in Christ. Let's